Welcome to Chew the Tech, a new podcast discussing security, privacy, and power. Over the coming months, we will cover a range of topics, providing an introduction to the fundamentals of the technology, discussing the impact on society, and what you can do about it. I'm Chris Colnane, a security and privacy researcher and consultant based in the UK, and I'm joined by my co-host, Vanessa Teague, based in Australia. I'm Vanessa Teague. I'm a cryptographer with a particular interest in election security and privacy and other cryptographic protocols that affect public decision making. Each podcast starts with an initial introduction to the topic, with an explainer of the key technologies or themes, followed by a discussion between ourselves and occasional guests on the experiences and insights on the topic. Our first topic is called Just Between Me and Who? We'll be looking at those apparently intimate conversations on the internet and asking how easy it is for other people to read your messages and look at your video. We'll explain what end-to-end encryption is and how and why you should use it. A recent joint statement from the Five Eyes Intelligence Network opens with a clear statement that encryption is an existential anchor of trust in a digital world and we do not support counterproductive and dangerous approaches that would materially weaken or limit security systems. Only to contradict that a few lines later in the same press release by saying that law enforcement must be able to access any communications they need to. The problem with this debate, in which many of the world's democratically elected governments support both sides at the same time, is that most of the world's citizens don't understand what it's about. Today we're going to look at what end-to-end encryption is, why it's a critically important security and privacy protection for billions of ordinary people, and why you need to use it for communications whenever you can. Text messages and emails were originally sent with no encryption. Today your messages are usually encrypted between your device and the service provider, then re-encrypted again to be sent to the person you wanted to communicate with. The messages themselves are usually not end-to-end encrypted. When Alice sends her message to Bob, her primary concern is that the message arrives intact. She may not be thinking about the privacy or security of the message at all. Likewise, Bob may be the same when sending his reply. Their primary goal of sending a message to each other has been achieved, so they should be happy, right? Well, maybe not. What Alice and Bob might not have realised is that anyone who controls the connection point between them can also read their messages. This interception happens silently in the background. Unless Alice and Bob have been told about it in advance, they might not even know it's taking place. But how likely is it that someone would want to intercept your communication? Unfortunately, it's very common, and it can happen for malicious or criminal reasons, for legitimate security and law enforcement reasons, or for more banal commercial reasons. If you're using the standard messaging app on your Android phone, you're probably not using end-to-end encryption. Direct messages on popular platforms like TikTok and Twitter are not end-to-end encrypted. The platform administrators can read your messages. Many network and platform providers are incentivized to do so to help build a profile of their customers because selling your attention is their core business. Law enforcement and intelligence agencies, even in democratic countries, also seem to have an insatiable appetite for data. With legislation like the Investigatory Powers Act in the United Kingdom, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act in the US, and the Telecommunications Identify and Disrupt Act in Australia, all containing provisions for interception, in some cases bulk interception, of communication data or metadata. It's also just a common cybersecurity defense technique to monitor connections into and out of a network looking for attackers. Left unencrypted, it's likely that your messages will be collected and processed in some form by someone other than the intended recipient. So what is encryption? Well, it's just a mathematical process for taking a message that can be read by anyone and turning it into a form that cannot be read by anyone without the appropriate key. The readable by anyone message is called the plain text, and the hidden message is called the ciphertext. There are two main forms of encryption, symmetric and asymmetric. With symmetric encryption, the same key is used for encryption as decryption. To encrypt our message, we take the plain text and combine it with the secret encryption key. That key is typically a randomly chosen number at least 250 binary digits long, which is nearly 80 decimal digits. In other words, a very, 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 very big number. It has to be large to ensure that any attacker can't break it or guess it just by trying all possible numbers. And it has to be picked randomly so they don't get any clues in their search to guess our key. We'll be using blue keys to represent symmetric mathematical keys. 
The ciphertext we get out of this process is protected so that no one without the secret key can recover the original message. It should look just like a series of random values. This is also important because it prevents the attacker getting any insight about what might have been contained within the plain text message, except possibly its length. To recover the original message, we take our ciphertext and combine it with the same secret key to undo the encryption and recover the original plain text. This is called decrypting. In asymmetric encryption, sometimes called public key encryption, we have two related keys. We have a public key that can be used for encryption and can be shared with anyone and even published on the internet. And we have a private key that must be kept secret and can be used for decryption. Private keys can also be used to digitally sign messages and their corresponding public keys to verify the signatures, but we won't be looking at that in this video. To encrypt our message, we take the plain text and combine it with our public key. We would also normally add some randomness into the mix as well to ensure that other people who send Alice the same message don't make exactly the same ciphertext. The output will again look just like random values, which is exactly what we want. When we want to decrypt, we have to combine our ciphertext with our private key to invert the encryption and recover the plain text. The great thing about this process is that the public key can be shared with anyone, but the ciphertext can only be decrypted by the private key. Anyone who has your public key can create a ciphertext that only you can decrypt. It is this property that is at the heart of both end-to-end -end encryption and security in general on the web. In practice, of course, it's a bit more complicated. Rather than encrypting directly with the public key, the preferred approach is a hybrid, a combination of both symmetric and asymmetric encryption. There are lots of reasons for this, but the main one is that symmetric encryption is much, much faster. So Alice can encrypt much larger quantities of data much more efficiently, which is important if she's sending Bob audio or video, which are large files. So in the hybrid variant, it starts off with Bob generating a public and private key pair, exactly as if he was using asymmetric encryption, in fact, the same key pair. Then when Alice wants to send a message or a file, she picks a random value to act as the symmetric encryption key. She encrypts the message that she really meant to send to Bob using her symmetric key with a symmetric encryption algorithm like AES. But how does Bob find out what this symmetric key is going to be? Well, Alice can tell him that by sending it encrypted with his public key. So then she sends two encryptions, the encryption of the message with the symmetric key she just generated, and the encryption of the symmetric key using Bob's public key. So Bob just reverses this process at the other end. First, he uses his private key to decrypt the symmetric key that Alice just made up. Then he uses the symmetric key to decrypt the actual message. Let's summarize the whole process using the hybrid encryption we've just discussed. We will assume that Alice and Bob have both respectively generated their key pairs. In other words, they each have their own public and private keys. This example is intended to show the basic use of encryption to protect messages, but as we shall see later, there remain problems with it, and the approaches used on the internet are in many ways more elegant. The first step is for Alice to send her public key to Bob. Bob will do the same, sending his public key to Alice. At the end of this first round of communication, Alice now has Bob's public key, and Bob has Alice's public key. These keys can be sent unencrypted because the values are safe to be made public. Even if there's an attacker present and listening to the communication, all they learn is Alice and Bob's public keys, which is fine. We do have to worry about an adversary who can alter them, but we'll ignore that for now. The next step is for Alice to generate a random symmetric key, encrypt it with Bob's public key, and send the ciphertext to Bob. At the same time, Bob is doing the equivalent. He generates his symmetric key, encrypts it with Alice's public key, and sends the ciphertext to her. Even if the attacker sees these messages, it doesn't matter because they are encrypted, so only the recipient can decrypt them and recover the respective symmetric key. At the end of this step, Alice has her own symmetric key, and she has Bob's symmetric key. Likewise, Bob has his own symmetric key and Alice's symmetric key. In effect, they have established a pair of shared secrets. It is important that Alice and Bob treat those symmetric keys as if they were their own secret keys. In other words, they should not be shared with anyone else. When Alice wants to send Bob a message, she takes Bob's symmetric key and encrypts her message with it and sends the ciphertext to Bob. On receipt of this message, Bob uses his symmetric key to decrypt the plaintext message and read it. When Bob wants to reply, he does the equivalent. He takes Alice's symmetric key, 
encrypts his message with it, and sends the output ciphertext to Alice. Alice uses her symmetric key to decrypt the plain text message and read it. The attacker in all of this has only seen encrypted messages. They cannot read them because they do not have access to either Alice's or Bob's private key, and therefore don't have access to their symmetric keys either. The first problem with this simple approach is that there are unnecessary secrets. Alice and Bob each have a shared secret, when in fact all they needed was a way to jointly generate a single shared secret. There is also a requirement that they can safely share their public keys without the attacker interfering and sending alternative keys. We will look at that later, but first let's look at a more efficient way of generating the shared secret. What we are going to look at is called the Diffie-Hellman key exchange and is used almost uniformly across the internet to establish a shared secret for secure web browsing. A common analogy for the process is the mixing of paints. We will use the paint analogy but include the mathematics as well. In the analogy we assume that once paints have been mixed, the original paints cannot be recovered from the combined mix. That's an analogy for a mathematical function that cannot be feasibly reversed once it's been computed in one direction. The first step is to establish some public parameters, known as P and G, which we will represent as the colour yellow. These can be published once and reused multiple times, or in the case of a web browser hard-coded into the browser itself. All the calculations are going to be performed mod P, which signifies modular arithmetic, which simply put means that the numbers wrap around when they reach the value of P. For example, 7 mod 5 is 2, because when we reach 5, we wrap the remaining 2 around to the start. Alice and Bob want to establish a shared secret. They are both already aware of the public parameters. Alice generates a secret value A, represented by the colour blue, and Bob generates a secret value B, represented by the colour red. Alice takes a copy of the public parameters, in our illustration the colour yellow, and combines it with her secret value A, represented by the colour blue, by calculating G to the power of A mod P to produce the colour green. Bob similarly takes a copy of the public parameters and calculates G to the power of B mod P to produce the colour orange. The combination of modular arithmetic and carefully chosen values for P and G creates a particular property of the result which is vital for security. That property is known as the discrete logarithm problem. In essence it creates a situation where the exponent, the to the power of part, cannot be recovered from the answer. As such, g to the power of a mod p produces a value in which even though everyone knows the value of g and p, the value of a cannot be recovered. Recalling our analogy, this is equivalent to not being able to separate back out the mixed paints. The next step is for Alice and Bob to exchange the values they just calculated. So Alice sends to Bob her g to the power of a mod p, and Bob sends to Alice his g to the power of b mod p. Because the A and the B cannot be recovered from these values, they can be sent unencrypted across the public internet. The final step is for Alice and Bob to combine their respectively received values with their own secret value. In the case of Alice, she takes the G to the power B mod P that Bob sent, the orange paint, and raises it to the power of A mod P, her blue paint, to create brown. Likewise, Bob takes G to the power of A mod P, the green paint he received from Alice, and raises it to the power of B mod P, his red paint, to also create brown. At this point Alice and Bob have successfully calculated their shared secret S. The equations look different because of the different order of the operations, but they produce the same values. Due to the way exponentiation works, g to the power of a mod p raised to the power of b mod p is the same as g to the power of a times b mod p. Likewise g to the power of b mod p raised to the power of a mod p is the same as g to the power of b times a mod p b times a and a times b are the same, the order in which a and b are written makes no difference. And thus Alice and Bob have calculated the same shared secret. Now what happens if Alice and Bob have more than one other friend? One of the great things about Diffie-Hellman key exchange is that it's not limited to just two parties. You can construct a shared secret between as many parties as you like. So let's imagine that Alice and Bob are joined by Kathy and they want to create a shared secret so they can communicate securely. The process is very similar to the two-party case with Alice and Bob. Again, there are some pre-agreed public parameters P and G, and all our calculations are mod P. Step one is for Alice to generate her secret value A, Bob to generate the secret value B, and Kathy to generate a secret value C. Alice sends to Bob G to the power of A mod P. Bob combines it with his value B by calculating G to the power of A mod P all to the power of B mod P to generate G to the power of A times B mod P. Bob then sends this value to Kathy. Kathy receives g to the power of a times b mod p and raises it to the power of her secret c to produce g to the power of a times b times c mod p, 
which is the ultimate shared secret that everybody needs to end up with. Now we have to make sure that Bob and Alice also end up with the same value. So step two is for Bob to calculate g to the power of b mod p and send it to Kathy. This is effectively the same process as step one, but we rotate it around by one person, starting with Bob this time. Kathy takes g to the power of b mod p and raises it to the power of her secret c to produce g to the power of b times c mod p. And she sends this to Alice. Alice combines it with her secret value a by raising it to the power of a to produce g to the power of b times c times a mod p which is equal to the shared secret that Kathy already has. Step three is to repeat it again, but this time starting with Kathy. She calculates g to the power of c mod p and sends it to Alice. Alice combines it with her secret value a by raising it to the power of a to get g to the power of c times a mod p, and she sends it to Bob, who computes the final combination by raising it to the power of b mod p. So everybody gets the same shared secret value, g to the power of a times b times c, in some order. At this point, Alice, Bob and Kathy have a shared secret value which they know they've contributed to and therefore can trust that it's been correctly constructed. Even if one of the others didn't do a good job of selecting their secret random values, the overall quality of the secret would still be guaranteed as long as one of them had done a good job of choosing a hard to guess key. To construct shared secrets with even more parties, the same principle is followed. All the parties are arranged in a circle and after each round, the starting position rotates by one. A round consists of the starting person raising g to their secret value and passing it on. Each subsequent party raises the received value to their secret value and passes it on until it reaches the person before the starting person who keeps the value they calculated and uses it as the shared secret. On the face of it, everything looks great. We have a way of efficiently generating a good quality shared secret. However, recall that we said some problems remain. That problem is knowing who we are communicating with. What if Alice is not actually communicating with Bob? What if instead of Bob she is actually communicating with an attacker pretending to be Bob? Or even worse, what if both Alice and Bob are communicating through the attacker? This is known as a person in the middle attack. The problem is that the plain Diffie Hellman key exchange does not include authentication. So there is nothing within the key exchange protocol itself that prevents an attacker impersonating another party. To resolve this, some form of authentication must be added on top for one or both of the parties. In TLS, the transport layer security, which is what is used by HTTPS in your web browser, it uses digital signatures and public key certificates to establish the identity of the target web server. This is effectively one-sided authentication, since only the server is authenticated, not the user. Where mutual authentication is required, for example services like Signal or WhatsApp, the authentication is achieved by comparing safety numbers to check they are the same, but this has to be performed in person or over an existing authenticated channel. As such, we can establish a secure connection between two parties without requiring any prior exchange of keys or certificates, but to be certain that we are communicating with a specific individual or party, we need some additional authentication. As a result, when deciding whether a connection is secure and is a true end-to-end -end encrypted connection, we need to consider exactly where the endpoints are. It is not sufficient to just check that the right type of key exchange or encryption is being used. For example, if Alice wants to communicate with Bob, she must ensure that the endpoint of the connection is actually Bob, and that the diffie hellman key exchange was performed just between her and Bob. Bob must likewise perform similar checks. If that is done, they can both be assured their communication is encrypted, and that no one else can read it. However, if Alice and Bob are communicating via a social media provider, even though their connection between themselves and the social media provider is encrypted, it is not end-to-end -end encrypted between Alice and Bob. The exact same key exchange protocol and cryptography might be being used, but because the endpoint is not the final destination, the intermediary, in this case the social media provider, can intercept and read all the messages. In effect, they act as the equivalent to the person in the middle attack. This type of setup is not rare. In fact, many web services use a person in the middle to inspect the web traffic for security reasons, with it often being implemented in a way that is hidden from the end user. This can present a real challenge to end users because some providers will talk about military grade encryption and possibly even end to end encryption when in fact there are additional parties intercepting the connection. Why is end to end encryption so important? Why is it worth all this extra effort to make sure that your connection is end to end encrypted? Well, there are a lot of reasons. First, just protection of your data. Data breaches and security lapses happen all the time. If your data was end-to-end -end encrypted, then even if the provider is breached and their database is leaked, your messages won't be readable by anybody but the party you intended to send them to. 
Second, it prevents providers from using your communications as data points in their profiles of you. Why should the service provider be able to read your private emails or your messages or scan the photos that you send to a friend? They are, after all, your private messages, and you're not intending to share them publicly, but you're communicating them to specific individuals. This isn't limited to just a few social media providers. The biggest online service providers are all collecting vast quantities of data on their users and using it to build detailed profiles of individuals so that they can target them better for targeted advertising for the benefit of the organisation, not the benefit of you. This isn't isolated to just service providers. Recent laws passed in many countries aim to make it easier for law enforcement and intelligence agencies to access private communication. And as we saw at the start, many governments are opposed to, or at least very ambivalent about, end-to-end -end encryption because it prevents them from accessing the private communication of citizens. In summary, end-to-end -end encryption is not new, nor is it dangerous. It is just encryption done right. The idea of being able to communicate privately dates back at least to Caesar. One of the earliest cryptographic ciphers was named after him, the Caesar cipher. What is new and potentially dangerous is the idea that interception by default is okay. This is a fundamental erosion of our right to private communication, which has existed since we have been able to talk, whether it be by whispering to someone in public or finding somewhere private to talk. This is not just about preventing someone reading your private messages. It is about the chilling effect ubiquitous interception has on open and free discussion, and by extension the very existence of the democracies we so cherish. Should we have to protect ourselves from wholesale interception? No. Do we have to protect ourselves from wholesale interception? Yes. That protection is end-to-end -end encryption. You've just seen a short introduction to end-to-end -end encryption that explained how it works, some of the challenges, and also some of the attempts that have been made to undermine it. In this portion of the video, we will discuss between us some of our experiences, concerns, and thoughts on the current and future state of end-to-end -end encryption. So to start with, Vanessa, we've mentioned in the video attempts by law enforcement and intelligence agencies to undermine end-to-end -end encryption. Uh, when we advocate for end-to-end -end encryption or call for its protection, certain people will respond by saying, if you have nothing to hide, you have nothing to fear. What do you say to those people? I think everyone has something to hide, right? Everyone has unique characteristics, political opinions that are offensive to their neighbour or their future employer, things about them that are a little bit different. Uh, and I think it's part of being human to have the right to be a little bit different to the other people around you and not to have to worry about whether that those differences can be weaponized against you in some way. And I think information can be weaponized against people because the risk that a person is denied a loan or denied a job or embarrassed in public can influence their behavior and uh, prevent them from living the life that they would want to live. Uh, I agree completely. Um, I think it's about um, control over the messages. It's not just about a single particular content on a single message. Um, it's deciding who you want to see that message and who you want it to be shared with. So, you know, on Facebook, you're free to share the message, but that's your choice. Um, if you're sending a message between the two of us, then I wouldn't expect it to be shared outside of that. And I think we have this natural notion of privacy in the in the physical world. When we go into a doctor's surgery, if the doctor came out and suddenly decided they were going to hold the consultation in the waiting room, you'd be quite alarmed and you'd say, well, hang on a minute. I expected privacy here. I think it should be in your office. And you would naturally assert that. And online, we have to do that same assertion now. The the ease with which our privacy can be invaded online means that we're actually having to defend it on a daily basis. And this idea that you actually have to assert that right is quite new to us and is, is a little bit different from where we are. Um, and I think naturally, it's unnerving to have people monitoring you. And that's unfortunately what's actually taking place online at the moment. And so if you imagine in your in your daily job, if somebody is watching over your shoulder, it's quite unnerving and you you, are good at your job and you, you know what you're doing, but it's still unnerving to have someone monitoring you. Whereas at times you may actually want that person if you've done something good or you want to demonstrate it, you want the person to look over your shoulder. And so I think it really comes down to this notion of controller deciding when and where you're providing that data and when and where you're providing access to it. Right. So, so much of the modern internet is designed around invading your privacy for commercial reasons so that they can figure out whether you like fluffy cats and show you a video of a fluffy cat for sale right at the point where you're most likely to buy it because it's all oriented around selling your attention to advertisers. And I think that that can tilt 
very quickly from relatively banal commercial exploitation to quite malicious, you know, finding out that you're a problem gambler and selling you, showing you gambling ads to finding out about your personal weaknesses or political preferences and deliberately uh, manipulating you or rather selling your attention to somebody who deliberately wants to manipulate you on that basis. I think privacy protections in the physical world are very intuitive. You tend to know whether you've been hidden by line of sight from a person. But privacy protections and privacy invasions in the electronic world are highly unintuitive. And in fact, our systems are often designed by people who have it or companies that have an incentive to make it seem as if we're having private conversations when in fact those conversations can be very easily intercepted and mined for data. I think that's absolutely right. I think there is an increasing technical hurdle to overcome just to know when your privacy is being invaded. Um, and that leads to a certain amount of privacy complacency because often these organizations are quick to claim privacy protections which maybe aren't there. Um, and I think it's a real challenge for you know the average person on the street to know what their privacy stance is at any time online, um, let alone get to the point of actually asserting it or defending it. I think they're in a, a difficult position against a much more powerful adversary in that organization. And it's a, a huge challenge for them in, in trying to actually know where their privacy stands and what they can do about it. We've discussed how end-to-end -end encryption is important for individual privacy and the communications between each other. Um, looking more broadly, what are the risks of weakening end-to-end -end encryption in the context of our civil liberties and democracies? Yes, well, heaps of things. I think, first of all, the issue we already discussed, the potential for la very large-scale political manipulation. Uh, that's really important. I think another important aspect is that end-to-end -end encryption and indeed online privacy and security generally increase the power of ordinary citizens uh, at the cost to centralised power. And I think the fact that the Australian government in particular and some other democratically elected governments have worked very hard in recent years to undermine the security of communications between citizens is very bad for democracy in the sense that it undermines ordinary people's attempts or potential to organise themselves politically and do the things that they want to do to change their country. As we see democracy increasingly moving online, whether it be through electronic counting, voting or voter registration, what are the implications of this move online? Well, making, making elections a lot less secure, primarily. Uh, if we look specifically at the question of end-to-end -end encryption and why that might be important for elections and why undermining it might be banned for election security, it's important to remember that the secret ballot was one of the original legislated privacy protections. It was introduced in the 1850s, and the reason it was introduced was to prevent coercion. They were concerned that working class men, who were much less powerful than voters had been before that time, might be influenced by more powerful men if their votes became publicly known. So the secret ballot was introduced specifically so that people could express their true preferences with the confidence that their political opinions couldn't be used against them in the context of employment or rental or anything else like that. Exactly the same reasons are highly relevant today, even though working class white men are no longer the least powerful voters in our most of our countries. So this idea that nobody should be able to figure out how you vote because if other people can figure out how you voted, then they can potentially use that information to manipulate you into voting in the way that they want rather than the way that you want is still a critically important part of securing the vote. Now, end-to-end -end encryption doesn't completely protect that possibility because it doesn't prevent someone from compromising the electronic device on which you're voting, and doesn't prevent someone from corrupting the electoral commission end and the receiving part of the vote. But it certainly makes manipulating you a fair bit harder because it makes it impossible to do it in transit on the internet. So Chris, this is all a bit depressing, isn't it? Uh, there are a lot of things that are very bad about modern online security and privacy. Let's, let's talk up the positives a bit. Can you tell us a bit about what techniques or services or software you'd recommend that a person use or habits that a person should develop 
if they want to improve their online security and privacy. There's lots of things you can do today which maybe weren't available five to ten years ago. And there's a number of tools and services you can use to improve your online security. Um, to begin with, the, the easy one is using an end-to-end -end encrypted messaging app, uh, something like Signal, you know, which is open and has been carefully examined. So whilst we can't absolutely guarantee that it's perfectly secure, it's been examined by a lot of people and is considered to be a safe and secure way of communicating today. It's freely available and it's very similar to other messaging platforms. So other than moving over to that platform, the actual interface and interaction is very similar. So it's an easy change for the average person to make. Um, it should be noted, however, that it's not metadata free. And when we talk about metadata, we're talking about the information that is about your communication, but not the communication itself. So the fact that you and I are communicating at a particular time or from a particular location would be metadata, but the actual communication would be the content which it can't see. And that's encrypted, but the metadata is potentially accessible. Um, now, Signal do go through steps to try and minimize that, but it's not completely eliminated. If you're more concerned with actually that level of, of communication, you have to use something like an anonymization network. So Tor is an example of that, and that's something that you can use for your online action, act, and that's something you can use for online browsing as well as communication. So if you're looking for end-to-end -end encrypted messaging via Tor, you can use something like Ricochet Refresh, which I'm involved with as well, and it allows you to basically use an instant messenger across um, a Tor network. So it's adding the combination of metadata free anonymous communication from Tor and providing a, a nice user interface on top of that. Um, using Tor for internet browsing is a, a good step forward if you want to protect that communication to a high level, um, but you do have to consider that there are slightly different trust assumptions going on, um, particularly if you're having to exit the Tor network onto a normal website and then get that communication back in. There are slight different differences in trust assumptions on that exit node. So it's something that you would need to look into before kind of adopting wholeheartedly, particularly if you're going to access secure services like um, online banking or online shopping via it, you would need to add a little bit of additional security and checks just to make sure that you didn't have a, a corrupt in exit node involved in your communication. Um, the other thing which are increasingly popular are things like VPN. So these are virtual private networks. So what these do is they allow you to effectively hide your connection from your ISP and by extension your government. But again, with the caveat that you're now trusting your VPN provider. So all you're doing is moving the trust assumption from one party to the next. So if you really don't trust your ISP or your country, but you do trust a VPN provider, then that's a great option to help provide prevent those two parties you don't trust from gaining access to seeing what websites you're browsing or potentially even what content you're browsing if they have a, if they're able to corrupt the entire communication. Um, end to end encryption obviously helps prevent that, but um, we have to rely on on certain other trust assumptions in terms of if they're seeing which which internet sites you're visiting, which is potentially sensitive information, even without the content of that site, if they just know the places you're visiting. So I've talked a bit about the, the technical aspects of online safety. Vanessa, do you think it is primarily a technical challenge or is there a requirement for behavioural change as well? Both, I think. Yes, it is primarily a technical challenge, but there are plenty of behavioural changes that you could make as well. I think the most obvious to me is not trusting things that don't deserve to be trusted. I think we've got very accustomed to the idea that our camera and our phone are the same device, but I really don't see any reason why that should necessarily be so. And I think some things just don't belong on the internet or on an internet connected device. And I think uh, probably the greatest beneficial behavioral change is not assuming that you can trust things that really you can't. Uh, for example, whether you're on Android or an iPhone, your cloud storage is not end-to-end -end encrypted, unless you've done something special to make it so. When you store your photographs or personal messages on the cloud that comes with your platform, you're almost certainly not encrypting them with the key that only you know, and they're almost certainly readable, at least in principle, by the administrators who have access to that cloud. So if you don't want that to be the case, turn off cloud storage or don't put your personal photos or personal messages on an internet connected device or encrypt them before you upload them. And it's that distinction between storing something in a digital setting and storing something in a physical setting. I think if you were storing your photos in a in a physical location, you would have some 
concern about what the photos were and you would potentially decide which photos you were going to store or which photos you weren't going to store in that archive um, and if you imagine back in the day which i remember um that you you took photos with film you would take that film into the the chemists or the the um photo processor and get that photo developed those photos developed and then they would hand you back your photos i think if in that scenario you were always conscious of the photos you were taking because somebody else was going to view them and that was a photo processor but there's still a photo processor often in this kind of digital yes. setting it's just that it's google or apple who are storing them or processing them in that way and i think we need to remember that 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 analogy hasn't entirely disappeared there is still this notion of somebody who potentially has access to your photos and that there may be a certain things that photos you shouldn't take and certainly photos you shouldn't take with an online device so chris we've just explained why end-to-end -end encryption once it's set up correctly uh cannot be broken assuming that the maths is sound yet both your government and mine the british government and the australian government have passed in recent years raft after raft of legislation with the objective of getting access to encrypted communications if end-to-end -end encryption can't be broken how do you think they're going to try to access the data i think as our lives become increasingly dependent on only a few online providers particularly apple google and facebook um, governments can use that relatively small number to exert an enormous amount of pressure on those organizations to either gain access to the data or to fundamentally change the way that their services work to facilitate easier access to that data and that's certainly something we've seen in terms of capabilities in the legislation that governments have passed is strengthening that ability to change how people are running their services or influence how they implement new services in order to allow them to gain access to the content um, i think we've certainly seen in rumors in the past that certain organizations may have changed from say a peer-to-peer end-to-end encrypted thing on their on their messaging to a more cloud-based service which then allowed greater in interception so skype for example um, is now considered to be largely able to be intercepted in terms of voice communication although they have recently reintroduced end-to-end -end encryption on text messaging but those changes are difficult to detect for the end user um, they can easily change the service without someone really understanding what the the impact's going to be um, I think increasingly we're going to see cybersecurity used as a a lever um, in order to gain access to more communication. So whether it's be under the excuse of inspecting content for viruses or malware, um, which in fact has a the result of leaking certain portions of the, your message or in fact the entire message. Um, so a good example is URL link checking. So when you're when you're entering a URL in an email or an instant messaging app and they then for example, check that that is not a malicious URL, what they're in fact doing is leaking the fact that you were sending that URL to someone. Um, and that's being performed on your client device as opposed to in transit in communication. So even though the end-to-end -end encryption still remains sound, what they're effectively doing is they're, they're gaining access to that and breaking the communication end-to-end -end security by actually accessing it on your end device. So they gain access either to the point where you enter it or the person where they, they're reading it. And so you can still have the good solid end-to-end -end encryption, but still someone is able to access your communications. And I think more broadly, we'll see targeting of devices themselves, um, whether it be through update channels or whether it be through, for example, compromising the keyboard on the device um, in order to see all of the communication that gets entered in i think that is more likely to be where they're going to go and then they can claim that they're not breaking end-to-end -end encryption but they're able to maintain the same access to the communication that they so desperately want to have access to so for example when privacy advocates see techniques like apple's photo scanning which takes place on the device um, we often get quite alarmed because we see it as the thin end of the wedge that has repeatedly been used to target encryption over many years um, so what we would expect to see is more usage of techniques like that to gain access to the actual device and the content on the device before it gets into secure end-to-end -end encrypted channels. So that's probably a good place to wrap up because I think that gives us a nice path forwards for the rest of our podcasts. We're going to talk about other ways of extracting data about you. We're going to talk about online identifiers, TLS proxies, electronic voting, and lots of other techniques for invading your privacy and techniques for you to defend yourself.